Welcome everybody. My name is Brianna Opst and I am the Associate Director of Theatre Education and Arts at Miami Children's Museum. We here at Miami Children's Museum are on the homeland of Ticasta peoples, Calusa peoples, United Confederation of Taino people, Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida. And we thank these past, present and future caretakers of the land and water, since we're surrounded by it here, um, for their stewardship. I wanted to welcome everybody today to our the very first of our quarterly conversations at Miami Children's Museum. The topic being world holidays, cultures, traditions and acceptance. We really hope that today is a dynamic discussion with our panelists and you here, our registered participants, um, as we hope to encourage and empower our children to see diversity in religion, traditions and celebrations um, as something important and something that makes uh, our community richer and better. All month long here at Miami Children's Museum, um, we are celebrating holidays around the world and uh, in person and virtually as well. We are celebrating holidays such as Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and some of the less visible holidays, uh, less visible to us here in the US, like Bodhi Day, St. Lucia Day, Yalda Nights, and many more. We find here at the museum, it is so important to encapsul encapsulate a diverse range of holidays not just the uh, most prominent and most visible ones. We want, we can never say all, um, but we encourage, want to say that most people, we want to feel like they are accepted and invited into our community to celebrate with us. Um, covering a wide range of holidays makes us and our children smarter, more empathetic, it creates awareness, it opens doors to more children to see themselves and their families. And like I said earlier, it makes um, for a richer and better community. Now enough about what we are doing at the museum. This program today is part of, of our World Holidays celebration. I would like to introduce the much smarter and brighter people, <laughs> um, our panelists today. Uh, feel free for everybody participating, you are welcome to have your cameras on or off. Um, we are welcome, I will encourage you to use the chat. So say hello, tell us where you are tuning in from. Um, we, like I said, we want this to be an interactive and dynamic uh, discussion. So you feel free to blow up the chat and I will monitor it as best as possible. So moving on to our guests here today, I'm going to introduce them all to you. Firstly, we have Amy Exum. She is a licensed mental health counselor and certified mindfulness informed professional from Baptist Health South Florida. She is also an American Diabetes Association mental health provider. So thank you so much, Amy, for joining us today. Thank you for having me and definitely not smarter or brighter than you, Brianna, <laughs> just different, right? Um, but really honored to be here with the panelists and with the uh, Miami Children's Museum. It's, it's, it's truly great to be able to have these conversations, especially during this time of year. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. Next up joining us, we have, do the spotlight, Demetrius Zigalatis from the University of Connecticut. He is an anthropologist and a cognitive scientist. He studies some of the things that make us human, focusing on religion and ritual, sports, cooperation, and the interaction between cognition and culture. So welcome, Demetrius. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, fantastic to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the introduction, uh, pretty much says it all. I'm an anthropologist and also a psychologist. And what I, what I study uh, is some of the things that make us human, but not the directly obvious ones. Some of the things that may at first glance seem puzzling, and that brings us to a lot of cultural traditions, uh, things like rituals and holiday traditions. And I'm particularly interested in some of the ways in which these things create community for, for people. They bring them closer together. And I think that's why I was invited. Excellent, thank you, Demetrius. And next up, we have Reverend Kevin Tisdale. 
the Reverend Kevin Tisdall is a retired senior executive from MTA New York City Transit. I was just there, took the subway uh, on the weekend, <laughs> um, and is an ordained minister who serves as the Minister of Education for Fort Lauderdale, Florida's Sunshine Cathedral, a progress progressive global fellowship that serves the LGBTQ plus community and its allies. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me, um, Brianna. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, maybe by the time we're finished, everybody will be more comfortable with simply saying happy holiday without um, recrimination. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing what um, the rest of the panelists and our guests um, have to say. Excellent, thank you, Kevin. All right, and next up we have Per Luth. Um, he is from the Consulate of Sweden. He has served as Honorary Consul of Sweden for Florida since he received his executor from the US State Department in January, on January 18th, 2006. Welcome, Per. Per, you're muted, my friend. Let me unmute. Yeah. Okay, that should be better. Yeah, I follow yes. your instruction before, so I guess I forgot to defollow them. <laughs> But anyway, nice to be with you. Uh, uh, yes, I represent the Kingdom of Sweden, uh, but I <clears throat> I have also had a a life and <clears throat> you know a normal normal work as well. So I've been on the global manufacturing technology stage for a long, long time. But anyway, I guess we're here to talk about Christmas, and uh, you know one of the interesting things in the Swedish tradition is that it it mimics also the the heathen times. So the, the, the word for Christmas is actually Yule, uh, which really talks about the time when Christmas occurs. And even the, the, uh, the name Father Christmas or Santa Claus is actually called a gnome in Swedish. So the Yule gnome is the, is the appropriate word for him. So a little bit different, otherwise many things are very similar to, to what happens here, here in the US uh, over the Christmas period. Excellent. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and finally, uh, last but definitely not least, we have Rabbi Jonathan Fish. Rabbi Jonathan Fish joined the synagogue of Temple Judea Coral Gables in February 2014. Since then, he is constantly inspired and driven by the innovative programming and community involvement and has helped create new programs at the synagogue within and outside of its walls. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us. Thank you. And uh, to those uh, brave souls who have turned your cameras on, thank you. It's great to see you, uh, Samantha Miller and to Pam. Uh, it's nice to see some friendly visit. Actually, in the chat, someone said from Orange County, California. Mm -hmm. I'm from Los Angeles, so like we're kind of related or not. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's nice to see some uh, some real friendly faces. Uh, to those of you who uh, put your uh, cameras on, thank you. Uh, I I'm here to learn alongside of you. I'm here to uh, possibly answer some burning questions. Um, and, uh, and certainly to, uh, to think, um, uh, to really actively engage and say, what are we doing around the holiday season for uh, our youngest uh, of people in our community? Um, how do we help answer questions from them? Uh, how do we help build community uh, so that we people from different uh, ethnic, uh, religion, uh, family backgrounds can just celebrate what December is really all about, which is just coming together. Uh, so I'm looking forward to our, our lively conversations. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, as I, I'm going to pull up all our panelists so that we can see them. My first question I'd like to open with to our panels uh, is, and maybe I'll, I'll start with Kevin. Um, hang on, let me get everybody's spotlight. Um, Reverend Kevin, when we first reached out to you and you heard about um, this program, you jumped at it straight away. So my question to everybody, and Kevin, if you can begin, please, is why are you here? Why do you think this is important conversations like this? Um, that's what I got for you. I'm here because anytime that we can engage in a conversation about um, a subject that somehow or another has become politicized and if we can bring it back to 
a conversation about how the different religions of the world celebrate their holidays, it makes us more comfortable in talking to our children about what it is to celebrate a holiday. Um, I was looking and there are almost 30 different holidays that are going to be celebrated from the middle of November until the middle of January. So if we are able to, in this time that we have together, to make ourselves more comfortable in talking about different traditions, then I think it'll be easier for us to talk to our kids about um, holidays and what it means to people and how we are all the same when we get down to the the basics um it, it, it's not necessary to be so parochial it's not necessary to say that someone else's tradition is not important what is important is that we all live on this globe we all celebrate in different ways and wouldn't it be great if we can get our children to celebrate with their friends in a way that is comfortable for their friends. So I jumped on it because I have, over my life, listened to how people just attack without understanding. And if we can add understanding to this conversation, I think we'll all be in better shape. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, let's have uh, Jonathan. Why, why are you here? Who forced you here? <laughs> It's first of all, a uh, just a, a huge, huge shout out to Miami Children's Museum for putting this together. Um, uh, I, I'm here because I want to be part of the, uh, the conversation. I want to be part of maybe even uh, a solution to uh, you know, what I experienced as a child where uh, going to public day school around December, I got Christmas trees to decorate. My mom had to send a note home saying, you know, our son, Jonathan, doesn't celebrate Christmas. Are there any other options? Uh, and then I got an Easter bunny in December. I, 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 th there were definitely some miss, missed opportunities and marks. And I think uh, anything that we can do as leaders of our own community, as educators, um, to help bridge the divide and say, you know, let's just celebrate each other uh, and, and do it in a way where everyone can feel comfortable uh, and allow maybe different options, uh, I think is really on the right track. So I want to be part of that um, and, and really par a partner in that solution. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Amy. Sure, yeah. I, so many reasons why why I'm here, um, you know, definitely echoing a little bit of, of what Rabbi Jonathan shared in my own personal experiences growing up. But really, um, I think diversity related is, is a passion of mine because I think sometimes we see diversity as a challenge or a struggle or something that may not be good. And it's really, strength that we all have together and it, it's a time where um cooperation and collaboration it can be challenging to find and if we can teach our children and ourselves how to work more collaboratively how to celebrate each other's differences um there there's just so much more joy and cheer to spread around if we're able to embrace it from all different cultures and it, it gives our children that that creative spark. Um, we're always, you know, asking kiddos and, and even adults to be, be themselves unique. Um, but a lot of times, even though we say that, that's not the message we send. So part of this conversation really um, is really, again, honor to be able to provide everyone here tools to say, how do I have these conversations with my children? How do I have conversations? like this with my peers so that this becomes um as, as reverend kevin mentioned earlier something that we're just more comfortable with talking about on a regular basis not only uh talking about but I, I know many people here are from different children's museums or classrooms like how do we implement this in in what we do on a bigger scale because personally maybe you're you do you run programs but you not might not be the people on the floor having the conversation. So how do we do bigger picture and then pass it on to our educators, our frontline staff, um, you know, I think is important too. Um, Pear and then uh, Demetrius. Yeah, it's nice, nice to be with you. Um, and, um, you know, my thinking about this, listening to what the panelists were talking about is that, and this may sound a bit controversial, but, um, 
if we can make Christmas more like Thanksgiving, I think we will all be a little better off somehow. If we can, you know, I don't want to minimize the religious aspects of Christmas, but, but um, you know, where I grew up, we don't even call it, it's not a Christian name, it's you, which really stems back from long, long time ago and has to do with when it's really dark. You know? At this time of year in, in Sweden, it's very, very dark. In the summer, it's kind of the other way around, but then this time around, it's very dark. And I think if we can somehow come together in a way where we're sharing and, and enjoying ourselves and, you know, giving presents is a nice thing. You know, it doesn't have to be just because, the, the, you know, it's in the Bible, but it's because it's a nice thing to give each other presents. And if we just came together in a way, not so focused on, on the religious message, but also on the wholesome message of communities coming together and talking about how can we together with all the aspects of, of, of life here, be a better a better society and I think that's what I think would be an interesting aspect to look at as we as we celebrate the holidays and everybody can join in. Um, Demetrius and while um, Demetrius is is speaking feel free in the chat I know some of you had already put in the registration why are you here feel free to to put in the chat why you are here and joining us today Demetrius. So I'm here because this resonates with so much with what I've been doing for two decades as an anthropologist. And there's, there's, there's an experience that is central to the discipline itself of anthropology, but also it's the experience of every single anthropologist as an individual who's ever gone into the field and gone in touch uh, with another culture. And this experience moves from a, a, an original uh, emphasis on what is uh, what makes us different from other peoples, those who we consider as the others. Uh, this is an experience that we call culture shock. Sometimes we feel uncomfortable when we engage with a with a culture that does things differently than, than we do, and this is uh, soon followed by the realization, given uh, enough engagement with this uh, culture, which we call participant observation, the realization that we're all fundamentally the same, and we have the same human needs and desires. And I think that one of the best ways to, to come to this realization is through participating in other people's traditions and rituals. This is something that, again, as an anthropologist, uh, you will be very quickly invited to join other people uh, in their celebrations. And doing that is one of the best ways of bringing people together. Because if you start approaching others on the basis of beliefs, then, the, then the, the initial reaction might be defensiveness, might be a, a sense of uh, difference. But when we start approaching others by inviting them to join uh, our uh, practices and celebrations, uh, this feels uh, uh, much more fun. We have developmental evidence that shows that children are intuitively attracted to ritual. And when they participate in those uh, in, in rituals, they, uh, they feel more connected to one another, much like uh, adults do. And this is, between, uh, this is because rituals and traditions are, in a sense, designed to do exactly that, to bring people closer together. Uh, for a variety of reasons. So one of the best opportunities to engage with other uh, communities and, and, and feel to the extent that you can feel part of those communities is by taking part in their celebrations. Yeah, Demetrius, um, when we initially spoke and connected a couple of weeks ago, um, this, this idea of ritual um, being the, the common ground, right? There is there's so many differences in, in, in the, the celebrations, but the, each of these different celebrations have ritual involved in it. Um, and wondering if you can just talk a little more and add to on the, the benefits of participating in, in ritual, the benefits to the two children specifically. So we could say, and, and, and one way, I, I, uh, one term I use to describe ritual is uh, that it is a social technology. It's one of those practices that we find in every human society, whether past or present, and uh, it serves specific functions uh, for us. So for individuals, it helps us cope with the adversities of, of life, and for communities, it helps us come closer together. And there's uh, scientific research that, that shows that there are multiple elements of those rituals and celebrations that actually serve those functions. So we know, for example, that coming together to share a meal uh, makes us feel more connected. We know that dancing and singing together 
uh, engaging in uh, uh, synchronous movement, or uh, um, whether this is moving around a, a tree or just chanting together, or whatever uh, uh, your culture prescribes, you will see that all kinds of celebrations, they tend to have those things um, in common. Uh, things like sensory pageantry, all those bells and whistles, uh, our brain perceives those as, as, as a cue for importance. When we come together and we do something extravagant, uh, and all of our senses are, are stimulated uh, through the, the singing and the smell of uh, food and the dancing and so on and so forth, uh, we feel that uh, this is an occasion that is worth uh, remembering uh, and, and celebrating. And these are some of the aspects of ritual that actually uh, serve to bring people closer together. And because these types of uh, uh, these aspects are uh, independent of belief, you, you find them uh, across the world's cultures. Uh, they don't, at the same time, they don't elicit this notion that we're all different. Uh, they elicit something different, which is curiosity. Oh, look, they do things differently. They, they look how fun it is. Some people for, uh, for New Year's uh, Day, for example, uh, they might, uh, in, in parts of Spanish-speaking uh, uh, Americas, uh, they might burn um, effigies, los, los muñecos de año viejo. Uh, in some other parts of the world, they might uh, perform firewalking rituals. In other parts of the world, they set up trees uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, I see it from my, uh, in my students. I see it in children. People are uh, immediately fascinated by those types of differences. They're not the types of differences that that uh, that tell you that uh, uh, you know these are different people. The types of differences that uh, that tell you, oh, these are fascinating people. I want to learn more about them. It's it's almost like sparking the the fascination in in the the difference, not just that, not the isolation, but the the fascination and the interest and the intrigue um, into something. Yes, Jonathan. So, uh, Justice um, uh, Sonia uh, Sotomayor spoke uh, at Temple Judea uh, pre-pandemic. So, I don't know, like 12 years ago. It's probably three years ago. I don't remember the years or the dates. Um, and she she wrote, she authored a book called Just Ask. Uh, it's a children's book. It's phenomenal. Uh, and it's a it's a it, it follows the story about a young child who, when she sees people who look different, how it's much better to just ask and say, hi, uh, you, you might be missing a leg. Like, what happened? Why? Versus just staring uh, awkwardly or maybe um, uh, painfully. And, and I think to uh, Dimitri's point, how much more stronger would we be as a community if we just asked and maybe participated in ritual? Not ours, case in point. Last night, my daughters went to... Uh, our neighbor's house with a gorgeous Christmas tree. And we got to hear and learn uh, and sit um, and uh, drink hot cocoa. Like what a treat that was to be a part of someone else's celebration, um, even for just uh, you know a half hour or so. Uh, and, and I think that would go a long, long distance. Just to ask um, might be better than letting our imaginations run wild about what goes on in someone's home and never really participate in it. Amy, I saw your hand up and then it came down. Yes, I, I just wanted to, to add on to uh, both what uh, Rabbi Jonathan and Demetra said, you know, that asking um, with, with the intention of curiosity, right, to, to better understand someone is so, it's, it's so important, right, and it, it puts us on the same plane to really just be curious about what's happening with the other person in a caring way. And then um, just going off of what Dimitri said, the, the rituals that um, the rituals where we have our children join in, it puts adults and children on the same playing uh, level ground, I guess, uh, for lack of better words, because there's so many things that we do as adults. We drive cars, we write checks, um, we buy groceries that children don't do. And, and we always see children mimicking their parents, right? They want to pretend to be on the cell phone. They want to pretend to write checks. Well, when we're practicing rituals with them together, all doing the same thing together. So not only does it bring that that human aspect of we're all, you know, we're all similar in, in um, some ways, but even that difference in age brings us together. Okay, children get to do the exact same thing as adults in this situation. Yeah, great, excellent point. 
sometimes they actually get to have a little bit more fun in the holiday season than <laughs> adults as well. Demetrius, your hand is up. Yes, I see that somebody in the chat says mm -hmm. on a personal level, I love the idea of celebration and not to celebrate uh, celebrating with everyone. However, I'm also an atheist and I often feel invisible because of it. Uh, and I'd like to say that this, is, this is, doesn't have to be this way. So when I ask my, my students, when I teach my course on, on religion, I uh, usually ask my students if they perform rituals. And because this is New England, um, the great majority of them, they say, no, we don't perform any rituals. And then we get into what it actually means to perform ritual. And by the end of the class, everybody has their hands up because we talk about things like graduation ceremonies. We talk about things like raising your, uh, your glass to make a toast. Uh, we talk about uh, other kinds of uh, holiday celebrations like New Year's that don't necessarily have to be uh, religious. And uh, they, they work for us. They, they work for us irrespective of our beliefs or even our uh, non-beliefs. And so it, specifically in the context of uh, talking to children, I'd like to, to say that a good way of approaching this is by starting with rituals, not by religious rituals or rituals that are, that are seen as, uh, as pertaining to a particular group of people, but rituals that, are, uh, that celebrate more generic uh, things in our lives, things like seasonal changes in, in New York, uh, no, sorry, uh, New Year's uh, rituals are, are a great example of, of this. So we had a question, um, you know, I think our, our, our discussion has been, you know, joining in with, with other people, joining in on their rituals. How, um, what is your view on people practicing or celebrating or borrowing or taking part of the different holidays that you know specifically that you celebrate and bringing them into their home their own home um you know for example i i i celebrate christmas in my home um what are your thoughts if you know to help my children understand i i bring in a menorah to my home even though that's something that i don't personally practice um what are people's thoughts and feelings on that it was a question um from one of our uh, participants Yeah. Um, let me get the onion. There we go. You know, the, the, <clears throat> the Christmas tree in most other languages does not have the word Christ or Christmas in it. And it really isn't a Christian tradition. I mean, there were no Christmas trees in Jerusalem in the, in the year 2000, in the 2000 years ago. And that came from a different tradition. In German, it's called Tannenbaum, for instance. And I think a Christmas tree is, is a nice thing to have in your house. It looks nice. And it just adds some additional nature. And, and, and I think uh, more people can, and my, you know, my, my brother um, is uh, a married a Jewish girl. And of course, so the family is Jewish, but they all have Christmas trees or they don't call it Christmas trees, but they all have. It. And I think there are some of these rituals that uh, uh, Dimitris talked about that could be augmented into other homes. You were talking about taking the menorah and have a menorah at home. That's nice too. You can get presents a bunch of times, you know, with the menorah. So that's that's a good that's a good addition to the tradition. So bringing the 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 ritual, the elements of the ritual from different traditions into a holistic approach to this, I think, could make some of these things more interesting and, and, and less strange and less fearful, maybe even. Uh, Kevin, Reverend Kevin. Uh, yeah, I grew up in New York City. Um, I went to public school in New York City and we celebrated all of the traditions of the Jewish religion as well as Christian um, religion. We always had a menorah in our house along with the Christmas tree. My mother made the mistake one year of putting up a silver Christmas tree. We never let her live that down. Um, but at um, Easter time, we celebrated Passover. We celebrated um, Easter because the two holidays are often very close together. So I think that it is wonderful to grow up, even if you are of one religion, um, learning about someone else's. Um, we had dreidels um, during this time of the year. Uh, we, we did a lot of things that 
one would not expect that would happen in a traditional African-American Baptist family, but we did it, never thought about it. And as I grew up, I learned that, well, maybe because we were in New York, we were a little different than the rest of the world. Um, I encourage everyone to introduce their children to many traditions. And the person that um, Demetrius was talking about um, wrote that they were, they are an atheist. And that's something that can be embraced also. You, you don't have to embrace anyone's particular religion. Um, you can think of some of the seasons as seasons of love and look at it in that way. Um, at our church, we, we cover every um, possible gamut of human relations. And we have agnostics and atheists who come to listen to a message of love. So if we can share with our families that the holiday seasons, whatever the holiday seasons are, are seasons of love and um, seasons of community, then we can move away from the whole, and as a, a minister, I'm saying this, move away from the whole religious thing and look at it as a time to come together as a people. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Demetrius, your hand is raised. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, mute you. Okay, now, I, I organized this ethnographic film school in Mauritius. Uh, so every year I bring students, mostly American students, into that setting. And we work with various communities. And invariably, every year, because it's wedding season, we get invited uh, to, uh, to attend weddings, Hindu weddings. Uh, and a lot of the times I've seen the local family the, the, uh, who's organizing the, the wedding invite us to, to dress like they do. So they will ask some of the girls in our, in our group to wear saris. And I've had um, uh, students sometimes say, oh, would that be cultural appropriation? Or perhaps refuse the invitation because they were worried that it was not their place to do that. And their, their, the reaction to this was always disappointment. I saw that these families were were actually, they felt that we, we, we just didn't honor their invitation. They Perhaps they felt offended, but they certainly felt disappointed. Uh, so I think there's this great value in, uh, in embracing other traditions. Having said that, it's best to do that when being invited to do that. Uh, and you don't have to wait for an invitation, obviously. You can just, you can just ask somebody earlier said, just ask. Uh, ask somebody to guide you through this process. If you want to take part in somebody else's uh, rituals, the best way to do it is to ask somebody to be guided. So do not start with the, the action, start with the person, because at, at the end of the day, that's what we're, that's what the goal of this is, to get to know a particular community uh, better. Yeah, and I, I like that um, the, you know, we've, we've touched on the, the just ask, right, inviting them in. So if in your home, you wanted to bring in a, another element of another tradition, you know, invite a friend in, invite a colleague in potentially that celebrates that tradition that can to teach you and your, your children about it. And the same, I think, can be said on a on a museum level, you know, or in a in an education setting, uh, inviting in the experts, inviting people in who actually practice um, a tradition uh, at, you know, as opposed to to someone who doesn't and then is trying to teach them. I think that's how you get across very like authentic and genuine um, programming. Um, uh, Rabbi Jonathan, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, many of us have mentioned, uh, you know, the idea of like in our home, we had a menorah. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts um, on that? Ah, uh, it's a great question. Um, that wasn't in the original questions you sent out. So that's a good question. Uh, my, I, have, I have lots of different thoughts. First and foremost, um, I, you know, to hear that Reverend uh, Kevin grew up in a house that was so filled with love and joy that they incorporated various elements from, you know, um, uh, different people's faiths, I, I think is absolutely beautiful and astonishing. Did not grow up in that same experience, same environment. Uh, 
I grew up in a small town where I was one of eight kids of like 3,400 students in a high school that was Jewish. Um, you know, I grew up hearing stories where, um, you know, uh, small Jewish institutions, congregations would fight with their city to say, let's have a menorah up next to the Christmas tree. And the city said, well, because of you, we're now getting rid of the Christmas tree. And you can imagine what that did to a small group of Jewish people living in a community that um, maybe didn't even recognize them or understand them. Uh, so I, I'm really all about coming together and celebrating uh, holidays. Uh, having a menorah up symbolizes to me that that is a house where people, it's like a mezuzah, a marking on the door, right? I see that that small little, uh, you know, uh, tilted object on the outside of someone's home. And I go, someone there is Jewish. Uh, if I need like matzo ball soup, I'm probably going to that house. Uh, so it, it tells me something, uh, seeing a house that has a menorah that no Jews live there, um, would, would be really be surprising to me. Uh, I, I invite the experience. Um, I think I'd want to be a part of it, uh, as, as Demetrius said. Um, and, uh, and I also think, you know, what the, the menorah itself, like just for context, none of the holidays of, of Hanukkah is, is in the Bible. It's not in any Jewish Bible at all. Uh, it was specifically not included because of the history of, of what the celebration is. You want to talk about the celebration of light. It has a celebration of light and part of it, but it's also about a small group of, of Israelites, ancient Israelites, who have overcome a massive powering state of authority. So imagine the Jewish people, they didn't want that in, in their books because any small group of Jews living in a community could threaten, theoretically, that overpowering uh, government. And so we said, let's not put that in our books. So it's actually found in later works called the Talmud, right? The Mishnah and the Gemara. And uh, really through there, it talks about this, the, the lighting and the Hanukkah. But what is it really about, the story of Hanukkah? It's about people coming together. So in that aspect, brothers and sisters coming together is really what the, the, the holiness of uh, the book of Maccabees, in my opinion, is really all about. Um, and, and so in that capacity, I'd say, yeah, light, have the menorah. I think that's beautiful. And then I'm also flipped on it. So it's a really good question, which is why I didn't raise my hand, but thank you so much for calling on me. <laughs> Just call, calling you out. <laughs> you are the Jewish representative. <laughs> um, I wanted to... Uh, then ask right it, there is a lot of you know there's no right or necessarily wrong like one answer i guess right in the, in these situations um we had a a couple of questions uh pre-registered questions that were about um biggest like programming programming within a museum you know we come to the the holiday season and you know, I think even in my time with Miami Children's Museum, there was sort of a time we, we didn't mention, we just said holidays or winter. We didn't name holidays. And now we're here in 2021 um, and we're saying we're celebrating, we're naming each of these holidays. You know, it's, it's like what you said, Jonathan, like um, your request for the menorah in the, the city, they took down and they're like, we can't do any of it then, you know? Um, and in the same respect, we can't do it all. And you know, who, who just said that there was 30 holidays, uh, Kevin, right? <laughs> Between November and, and January, you know, we, we, we can't do them all. So how do we bring in this idea of, you know, cultural diversity of, of holidays, um, you know, into the, our programming in, in our classrooms, in our museums? How do we do it well? How do we do it like for real? you know, not just touching on it and say, oh, look at us, look what we're all doing. How do we bring it into, um, you know, not our children in our homes, but the, the children that we encounter in an educational um, situation? Uh, per. Just wanted to, uh, to uh, you know, get back to what the Reverend was talking about, which is sort of where I was aiming as well, which was sort of, let's take some of the religious aspects of this celebration out so we can be a more holistic, have a more holistic approach to the holidays. But of course, for a museum, who I'm sure relies on donations from a number of individuals, that's gonna be a pretty tight rope to manage. Huh? 
how do you do that and and still have people feel good about this? And um, and I think it has to, but I think it has to start with, and the Reverend was was talking about that as, uh, oh, the, the the Rabbi was talking about that as well. Jonathan was talking about that as well. How do we include all these different, let's call them rituals, just to point out what Demetrius was talking about here, in the holistic view of rituals, because they're all fun. I mean, the 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 Hanukkah songs are all great. And, uh, you know, you can do that together with the Christmas tree songs as well. And they all find, you know, more of a holistic approach. But I think for the museum, that's going to be an interesting um, approach to take. So congratulations and good luck is kind of what I'm saying. Thank you. <laughs> um, Amy, I saw that your hand was up. Sure, yeah. Um, good good points, Pear. Definitely good real, realist points, right? Uh, I, I was going to say, you know, some a lot of times I think we feel like uh, as an organization, as a museum, as a parent, we feel like we have to have all the answers and know, know exactly how to do these things. And I just want to remind everyone, this is a process, right? We're going to get things, I think, Brianna, you mentioned it, but we're going to get some things right. We're going to get some things wrong. Um, and, and so just keeping that in mind as you as you move forward. Um, something tangible I can give, give uh, the listeners out there is engage your community, engage your children, um, ask your community, make it part of an exhibit, make it part of your entrance when you come in to, to put in suggestions. What would you like to see? Um, get a feel from, from your community, reach out to community centers. How is your community made up? Um, and maybe you'll highlight different um, different rituals throughout the year. It's not just during this holiday season that, that we talk about. Um, but the more I think feedback and questions that we, we ask to our community, we give them the power to say what they're interested in seeing. And the same thing with our children. You know, I, I know a lot of questions were, surround, were around how do we empower children, not just our own children, but those children in the classroom. It's that option of choice, giving them choice. What are you interested in learning, sweetie. You know, same thing in the classroom, taking a vote or having each children pick an assignment that they get to bring a holiday that they're interested in talking about that's new to them, right? Um, but the power of choice is, is, is true, is really incredible. And when you give children that choice, they do feel empowered. And when we listen to them, as well they do feel empowered um, so there's a lot of learning that we can do as leaders in our community as leaders in the classroom and leaders of our homes uh, the more we listen the I think the easier answering some of these questions and touching on different holidays will become um, an interesting discussion came up at, at the museum a Amy jumping off what you said we had um, we partnered with the Mexican consulate for Dias de los Mortos and they created for us the most beautiful ofrenda in our front entrance. And it was, it was, it was amazing. Like it brought tears to my eyes. Like it was just huge and amazing. And, and I, um, that idea of inviting the community and asking them, you know, like if we ask some community to, hey, in this little corner, can you make a, a, a Christmas display, you know? Hey, can you make a, a Kwanzaa display? We know that you know the, your community celebrates that. Come on in and and create that for us, um, and 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 so forth. Like, uh, you know, if if there was that feedback or that that um, that dialogue with the community, um, and finding out what they want to see, and then say, well, can you just help us create that? <laughs> um, be really cool to see, Demetrius. Yeah, I think uh, this question is a. Uh is a good uh, reason to go back to something I said earlier and, and it resonates with uh, what other people have said. Uh, because you have to navigate that rope that Per uh, mentioned, you don't, you don't have to, uh, uh, to look at or to start with uh, rituals that are very heavily related to religion. That also gives you other opportunities because you have uh, in practical terms, uh, unique programming all year round. So things like New Year's uh, rituals, uh, 
and celebrations. First of all, they give children the opportunity to think and to realize, for example, that New Year is not the same uh, around the world. Some people celebrate New Year in March, others celebrate in June, others in the fall, which gives you a very nice spread throughout the year. Uh, so if you want to uh, uh, introduce, let's say, the Greek community, instead of focusing on something like Easter, which is very uh, closely, obviously related to, to religion, maybe you uh, you focus on Greek New Year's and uh, all we do is bake a, a pie and we don't typically think of it as a very religious celebration, but it's a, it's a big celebration nonetheless. Or maybe if you want to introduce the Thai community, maybe you... Uh, you have a version of the Songram, which is a very fun uh, New Year's uh, ritual taking place in March that involves actually soaking each other with water. And I am sure kids would love that. Or things like Holi, uh, which uh, is a lot of fun for, uh, you know, in terms of uh, Hindu culture and so on and so forth. So instead of starting with uh, rituals that are very heavily connected to dogmas, uh, perhaps start with the ones that are, that are mostly about uh, fun and play. Yeah, I mean, I really loved um, earlier. Yes, Kevin, I see your hand go up because I was, I was going to say, um, you know, that that season of love that you said, you know, what unites us, the season of rituals. Like, I know rituals are all year long, but, um, you know, that that idea of, of the fundamental part of the celebrating of these religious moments is, is food, is singing, is dancing, all those things, Dimitris, that you were saying is coming together. Um, yeah, sorry, Kevin, go. No, I I was just reading um, in the um, chat, um, Ali Sullivan of Children's Museum of Richmond um, wrote, children can be exposed to different traditions through literature very early in life. If we bring curiosity and enthusiasm about other traditions, that's what children are going to learn to embrace. Um, in my household, my parents, my mother more than my father, um, watched her children and understood what motivated them to learn. She knew that if she put a book down anywhere um, in the house, I would pick it up and I would read it. Um, not for nothing, that's how I learned about the birds and the bees. <laughs> so we learn what our children like, we learn how our children learn and we present them with the opportunities to see more of the world through their eyes in a way that resonates with them. Yeah, and we talk about all the time at the museum of diversifying like our museum bookshelves, the classroom bookshelves, the at home bookshelves, you know, it, it, it's, it's so important because, you know, if you're reading to young children every night, which you should be, um, it, you gotta give them a, a selection. Um, that represents like <laughs> who they are, who that the the person next to them are. Um, you know, it's it's really important. Amy, I saw your hand, and then um, Rabbi Jonathan. Yeah, I and and I know I I'm sorry, my internet kicked me off for a second. So if this has already been said, please let me know. But I I don't think there's ever a conversation that can really be had about diversity, um, different cultures when when we're not talking about also taking a look at our preconceived ideas and notions, right? As um, uh, those of you who are listening who are uh, managing programs or managing museums and classrooms, we all have biases, right? That's, that's okay. That's how our brain works. We like to compartmentalize things. It keeps things simple for us and for us to process it. But I really encourage everyone who's listening to also ask, you know, yourselves, what are the biases or what are some of the preconceived notions that I might have that maybe pushing or skewing our programming in one direction or another. Um, just opening ourselves up to that question will, will actually lead to us being able to see a lot of different things and openings um, for your own institutions and organizations to bring in different types of thinking and different types of backgrounds. So just wanted to, to throw that out there. Yeah, you're definitely checking it twice yourself, right? <laughs> um, Rabbi Jonathan. I remember when I was uh, in elementary school, again, I, I was 0.05% of the population uh, of Jews in the, in the community I lived in. Um, uh, the teacher empowered uh, the small group of people who felt really like minorities to share about their experiences of the holidays. So I got to bring in latkes and donuts and dreidels and we sat and we played dreidel. 
I felt like the coolest kid and I was far from, I became a rabbi. I wasn't that cool. Right. So I, I thought I was, I was living the dream. And um, I even remember it probably was fourth grade that uh, someone had heard the, the spiel before. I think the school let me do this every single year, which was really nice. Um, and he, uh, this little boy brought his mother who uh, was, was, de- was, was uh, hard of hearing was deaf. And um, I learned that day how to say happy Hanukkah in sign language. And that has stuck with me every single year uh, that I teach my children in my congregation. You know, it's little things. So uh, sometimes knowing your community and then giving those people in your community the freedom to say, here's 30 minutes, teach us, bake for us, like communicate with us. What is it that you do that uh, I may not be aware of? And Usually you find when you make those outreaches to your community, people want to share, you know, and especially a a platform that has children involved. There is an enthusiasm to to share and be present and to teach with kids. Um, So it it, it is that that outreach um, that is so important and that invitation in and making sure that your your space is a place where they can come in and feel welcomed and 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 able to to teach and share about themselves and their culture and community. We had a, um, a question um, about vetting programs and performance providers. So, you know, that idea of inviting people in. We, we um, <clears throat> have guests come in and, and perform for us and cook for us and share for us. How do we, what is your recommendation in, in, in vetting these providers, um, these contractors that we invite into our spaces? Hard, right? <laughs> Jonathan, go for it. And then, and then Demetrius? I saw Amy actually unmute before I did, so I'll, I'll oh. pass this off to Amy, I'm sorry. Oh no, go, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I think speaking to, you know, local leaders in the community, if someone comes up and approaches you about an, uh, an opportunity to engage and you're not familiar with the institution, uh, you know, assuming you have partnerships with um, different, uh, uh, whether it's faith-based leaders or not, uh, I would check in with them. And then, you know, that's another opportunity to partner with another institution uh, and bring their 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 wisdom, uh, their wealth uh, into your your community. So I, that, that would be my first my first stop. Yeah, I would, I would ditto what uh, Rabbi Jonathan said. And then on top of that, you know, and even if you get great, great feedback or referrals from other organizations, having them present to you beforehand, doing, uh, doing an example of what they would do, what they would say, what their intentions are. Sometimes, you know, some groups are really good fit for a specific type of organization and it's not the best for yours. Um, and especially I think when, since we're focusing on children, that's another aspect, right? A lot of times we just think that we can translate things that are for adults to kiddos. Um, and that's not always the case. So making sure that it's age appropriate, it makes sense. Um, and that people who are giving Giving you their services are able to answer some of the tougher questions that kiddos might ask. Demetrius? So I don't have any professional advice here, but I, but I will say what, what I suppose I would say that um, if you want to vet uh, uh, guests, well, then you do this. You just talk to people. Uh, a lot of the times I, I discuss with colleagues in other uh, fields of the social sciences who, who study uh, human behavior, but they, they do it in a way that is um, that never engages with uh, with actual human beings. Uh, I, I think numbers can can tell you a lot of things, and that's my other hat as a psychologist. But uh, but if you if you really want to understand uh, if somebody is going to be good for what you're looking for, there's nothing like a conversation. Yeah, great. Uh, oh yes, uh, Reverend Kevin. Just real quick, um, the internet is an amazing place to go to to find out about people. Um, Every single one of us who has a public persona has information about us on the internet um, in our own words. So look that person up, look at some of the things that they have talked about and see if they fit in in what you're looking for. 
Um, I know that's how we found a number of people to come speak um, at our church that we may not have heard about, but who had a message that resonated with us. So don't be afraid of the internet and you don't have to necessarily have that be the only arbiter, but it's a good one. Yeah, really, really great points. Um, and I wanted to just touch on one more question. If anyone else has them in the, the chat, we'll um, pop them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand to, to ask a question. Um, is making the pro, we've talked about it being meaningful. Um, we've talked about being genuine and something that um, Pear touched on, um, you know, in terms of like donors, um, how do we make it marketable? How do we make this programming marketable to everyone? Everyone's a big word, to a lot of people. Um, when we are, are, are talking about these holidays and, and someone who potentially, you know, a family that is an atheist family, um, how do we make it a little shiny for everybody and inviting them into our, our in institutions? I see thinking faces. Pear? Yeah, I, you know, maybe, I mean, uh, Demetrius was the one who, who put this word out here about rituals. Maybe that's not a bad word to use in terms of, you know, holiday rituals or hol different holiday traditions and, and trying to make it less of a, an issue that some donors may have an issue with. And I understand that you got to work, you got to thread that real carefully. But I think, um, I think that could be one way. But also when you invite people in, in today's society, add vet and vet and vet before you bring people in, because you don't know what you're going to get. If you don't know the person, you don't know the organization, I'll be real careful. Just as a, bring them in and check them out for sure. You know. Anyone else want to touch on the marketability? Um, you know, I'm sure Dimitris could, could comment on this too, but, uh, you know, talking about the intention and the feeling behind what your program is going to be doing, right? We connect as human beings on feelings. We can all think of a time when we feel, felt left out or we felt um, somebody was mean to us or we felt alone. And when we talk about those feelings, people connect with them. And so maybe it's not the exact culture or the holiday that that you and your family have celebrated, um, but connecting with people on the, that emotional level is a really good way to, to draw people in and to explain to them why, why having a program about this is so important. Um, that would be my, my suggestion. Yeah, listing the, the, the benefits of, of all those things, Demetrius, that you listed at the beginning there, uh, of the dance, of the food, the senses, right? When those senses are sparked and it sparks that enthusiasm that excitement um, makes us all happier and better people. <laughs> I feel a lot of people are nicer around the holiday time. <laughs> Some are not so much, but, <laughs> um, but yes, awesome. So if we do not have um, any further questions um, uh, or comments from the chat, uh, we will begin to, to wrap up our quarterly conversation. Um, and I do want to give a big shout out to our panelists. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy. We've got a nice quote, so we'll have a little read of that. But um, it says, Maya Angelou quote has always been, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. And just bringing that essence of that, the feelings of ritual and how it makes us as adults and children, right, the level playing field. Um, makes us feel and and then turning that into a, a nice celebratory program or educational lesson in your classroom or a conversation in your family, um, I think is really important. So thank you, uh, Amy and Pear, uh, Kevin, Jonathan and Demetrius for uh, joining us here today on behalf of Miami Children's Museum. I, like I said, this is our first quarterly conversation um, sparked out of a, a panel we had earlier during the, the pandemic for our Pride Month. This is 
really the first and, and, and starting of a whole new program. So thank you, um, the five of you for joining us. Thank you definitely all to our participants for being here. I do hope that you got something out of it. Uh, everybody that registered um, and are here today, any sort of resources that were mentioned, you know, um, like the Just Ask book um, and so forth, we will we'll send out those resources that were mentioned in our conversation today. Um, and without that, without further ado, I will tell you first, our next quarterly conversation so that you can mark it in your calendar. Our next quarterly conversation is going to be, so save the date, on March 16th, we're going to try an evening one at 7 p.m. And it's called Coping with Uncertain Times, Helping Children Navigate Through Mental Health. So an interesting and giant topic. We like to tackle the big ones, I guess. Um, so please mark your calendars and, and look out for um, our registration to that. And um, I think we should all end by just saying happy holidays. Reverend Kevin said that at the, at the beginning, right? Making us all just feel a little more comfortable saying happy holidays or happy rituals or happy season of love. Uh, <laughs> so happy holidays to everybody. And uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I would like someone said contact info for the panel as a possible follow-up questions. Um, we will talk to the panelists to, to see if we can we can pass out their their contact information and you can potentially receive that um, with any list of resources that came up. So thank you very much, Jesse, for that question. And thank you everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you for you. being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you.